Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. Uh, this time the background behind me is the island of Idra, uh, where, as I mentioned before, I spent a couple of days where I took this picture, uh, where Leonard Cohen wrote A Bird on the Wire. Like a bird on the wire, like a drunk in a midnight choir, I have tried in my way to be free. So we've got a wire there, but I don't see a bird. Uh, so Leonard has deceived us again. Anyway, uh, uh, back in episode two, I mentioned uh, Alexander Berkman's uh, 1929 book, The ABC of Communist Anarchism, which incidentally is also published under the title ABC of Anarchism and what is communist anarchism and what is anarchism and now and after, but they're all the same book. And I mentioned that it shouldn't be confused with the Soviet textbook uh, from 10 years earlier, the ABC of communism by Nikolai Bukharin and Evgeny Preobrazhensky. Uh, but it's also said back then that, um, uh, that, that, that the ABC of communism is also an interesting work and that I wanted to say something about it in a later episode, Well later episode is now. And uh, uh, so here we are. So Bukharin and Priya Brzezinski were both uh, top officials in the Soviet Union under Lenin and later under Stalin. Uh, ABC of Communism was the official Soviet textbook on communism for a long time. Uh, and uh, after uh, uh, you know, after writing this, Bukharin and Prilopoczynski ended up diverging somewhat in their ideological outlook. Uh, Bukharin wanted to, you know, Bukharin was the architect of the new economic policy that wanted more of a market uh, economy, he wanted to slow down the process of collectivization. Prilopoczynski, if anything, wanted to speed it up. It's a dispute that Stalin resolved by killing them both. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I want to talk about how Bukharin and Preobrzezhensky define uh, capitalism and how and that, what the distinction they draw between capitalism and uh, and what we might think of as the kind of free market that left-wing market anarchists or free market uh, anti-capitalists favor. So in book one of the ABC of Communism, they write, if we study how economic life is carried on under the capitalist regime, we see that its primary characteristic is the production of commodities. A commodity is not simply a product, but something produced for the market. A product made for the producer himself, made for his own use, is not a commodity. It only becomes a commodity when it is bought and sold, when, that is to say, it is produced for a buyer, for the market. We see, therefore, that the primary characteristic of the capitalist system is a commodity economy, that is, an economy which produces for the market. Okay, uh, but uh, they do not treat production for a market as sufficient to define capitalism. And so they do not treat a market economy and a capitalist economy as equivalent, uh, because they go on to say, the mere existence of a commodity economy does not alone suffice to constitute capitalism. A commodity economy can exist, although there are no capitalists. For instance, the economy in which the only producers are independent artisans. They produce for the market, they sell their products. Thus, these products are undoubtedly commodities and the whole production is commodity production. Nevertheless, this is not capitalist production. It is nothing more than simple commodity production. In order that a simple commodity economy should be transformed into capitalist production, it is necessary on the one hand that the means of production, tools, machinery, buildings, land, etc., should become the private property of a comparatively limited class of wealthy capitalists, and on the other that there should ensue the ruin of most of the independent artisans and peasants and their conversion into wage workers. The small group of the wealthy owns everything, the huge masses of the poor 
own nothing but the hands with which they work. This monopoly of the means of production by the capitalist class is the second leading characteristic of the capitalist system. So as uh, Bukharin and Preo Brzezinski are presenting it, what distinguishes capitalism from uh, a simple commodity economy is that both are markets. Um, uh, both involve production for the market, not just for personal consumption, but uh, the simple commodity economy uh, is distinguished from capitalism because under capitalism, there's a concentration of ownership of the means of production in the hands of a few, such that everyone else is forced uh, to work as wage laborers for that few. So notice it's not just some crazy left libertarian idea that there's a distinction between markets and capitalism. This is the standard Soviet line as well. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind, you know, the, sort of the historical context here. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, wage labor was the exception rather than the rule. Um, on the one hand, uh, you know, there was, you know, serfdom, which wasn't really wage labor. On the other hand, there were the, um, you know, the new independent towns where uh, someone would be a wage laborer temporarily as a, uh, you know, as a, as an apprentice uh, to a journeyman, to a, to a master craftsman, but that was only supposed to be a, a, a temporary period. Uh, there was a, uh, and, uh, you know, in the, um, in the cities, the, you know, the cities that the bourgeoisie draws its name from originally, uh, the bourgeois uh, city uh, was uh, a city that was not characterized by wage labor except as a temporary period of training. Uh, and the point was for people to become independent uh, craftsmen. All right, so uh, Bukharin and Preobrzezinski's objection is to capitalism. It's capitalism they regard as oppressive. They do not seem to regard the simple commodity economy as oppressive. And although they describe the simple commodity economy as one in which there are no capitalists, in which everyone's an independent producer, it doesn't seem as though that's essential to their definition. Uh, you know, if not everyone were an independent producer, if some people were, you know, were part of workers' co-ops and so forth, presumably they would have no objection to that. And even if there's some capitalists, and even if there's some people performing wage labor for those capitalists, that doesn't seem to be enough to make uh, for the kind of objectionable capitalism they mind. Because the, what they mind about capitalism is not that there are some capitalists and that there's some wage labor. Um, what they mind is the concentration of ownership uh, in, the, in, uh, in the hands of a few capitalists in such a way that closes off most alternatives to wage labor and thus forces people to become wage laborers. If people, you know, if, if you had a system where wage labor was one option among many, it seems as though they wouldn't have an objection to that. Now, they may think that that's not, you know, that's not likely or possible. They might think that, you know, no one would ever choose wage labor unless they were forced into it. Um, you know, we could, you know, we could doubt that. We might think there are many cases where you might prefer wage labor uh, if, uh, you know, for some reason or other uh, to be either being an independent producer or to being a member of a workers' co-op. Uh, you know, especially if there are alternatives to wage labor uh, and the competition from those alternatives would presumably make wage labor less onerous uh, than it often is in uh, in the actual system. But in any case, whether or not they think it would be likely, it seems like they don't have any inherent objection to uh, a simple commodity economy understood as one where you don't have a concentration of ownership that forces the vast majority of people into wage labor. One in which wage labor, if it exists, is one of a number of uh, viable options alongside independent producers, workers' co-ops and whatever. So in other words, thinking of simple commodity economy that way, it's more or less what left-wing market anarchists or free market anti-capitalists advocate. So uh, if their objection is to capitalism, not to the simple commodity economy, 
why aren't the advocates of the simple commodity economy? Uh, you know, in other words, why are they, uh, you know, who, you know, why are they Marxists instead of being, you know, one of us, uh, the free market anti-capitalists? Well, the reason is that they think that uh, the simple commodity economy is unstable. That it contains within itself the seeds of its own destruction. It will naturally, inevitably morph, and indeed has inevitably morphed into capitalism in the sense of the concentration of ownership of the means of production in the hands of a small employing class. Uh, and here's their argument. Now, wherever private ownership and commodity production exist, there is a struggle for buyers or competition among sellers. Even in the days before there were factory owners, workshop owners, and great capitalists, when there were only independent artisans, these artisans struggled one with another for buyers. The strongest and most acquisitive among them, the one who had the best tools and was the cleverest, especially the one who put by money, that is the one who saved, the one who was thrifty, was always the one who came to the top, attracted custom and ruined his rivals. Thus the system of petty ownership and the commodity economy that was based upon it contained the germs of large scale ownership and implied the ruin of many. A simple commodity economy contains within itself the germs that will lead to the impoverishment of some and the enrichment of others. This is what has actually occurred. In all countries alike, most of the independent artisans and small masters have been ruined. The poorest were forced in the end to sell their tools. From masters, they became men whose sole possession was a pair of hands. Those on the other hand who were richer grew more wealthy still. They rebuilt their workshops on a more extensive scale, installed new machinery, began to employ, employ more work people, became factory owners. Little by little, there passed in the hands of these wealthy persons all that was necessary for production. Factory buildings, machinery, raw materials, warehouses and shops, dwelling houses, workshops, mines, railways, steamships, the land, in the word, all the means of production. All these means of production became the exclusive property of the capitalist class. They became, as the phrase runs, a monopoly of the capitalist class. So Bukharin and Priyo Brzezinski are making two claims here. First, they're claiming that, as a matter of fact, if you were to start from a pure, simple commodity economy uh, and then just let the laws of the market run freely, so no, uh, you know, no state intervention to uh, promote the rise of capitalism, just, just the ordinary rules of economics running within a simple commodity economy, the system would automatically transform into capitalism in the monopolistic sense. And second, they claim that this is what actually happened. Now, this is strikingly at odds with what Karl Marx himself claims in Capital. So in Capital, this is volume one, book eight, chapter 26. He's talking about primitive accumulation. In other words, the, um, the means by which uh, the capitalist class acquired its original uh, uh, monopoly of the means of production. He writes, primitive accumulation plays in political economy about the same part as original sin in theology. In times long gone by, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite. The other, lazy rascals, spending their substance and more in riotous living. Thus it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth, and the latter sort had at last nothing to sell except their own skins. And from this original sin dates the poverty of the great majority. Such insipid childishness is every day preached to us in the defense of property. In actual history, it is notorious that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, briefly, force, play the great part. These new freedmen became sellers of themselves only after they had been robbed of all their own means of production. And the history of this, their expropriation, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. And two chapters later, in chapter 28, he writes, the agricultural people were first forcibly expropriated from the soil, driven from their homes, turned into vagabonds, and then whipped, 
branded, tortured by laws grotesquely terrible into the discipline necessary for the wage system. During the historical genesis of capitalist production, the bourgeoisie at its rise wants and uses the power of the state to regulate wages, that is to force them within the limits suitable for surplus value making, to lengthen the working day and to keep the laborer himself in the normal degree of dependence. This is an essential element of the so-called primitive accumulation. So in other words, Marx said that it was essential, not just that this is what happened, but it was essential that the use of force and in particular state force was needed to transform a simple commodity economy into a capitalist system. Which of course is the same claim that left-wing market anarchists and free market anti-capitalists make today, that uh, the, the kind of concentration of ownership that we see under monopoly capitalism isn't possible in a purely free market without government intervention or other forms of force because uh, competition is a leveling force uh, that as long as people are free to imitate other people's success, uh, no one can permanently gain a massive uh, advantage in the market from their own success. Uh, so Marx seems to be denying both of the claims that Bukharin and Pryor Brzezinski are asserting. Uh, he's denying that as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, the uh, capitalist concentration of ownership uh, arose simply you know, through you know, frugality, you know, from what Bukharin and Fruzinski call, uh, Fruzinski call putting money by, uh, and he calls frugality. Um, basically the idea that you know, thrift is what creates the division of classes. He's denying that it happened that way. He's saying that as a matter of fact, it happened through force, in particular through state force. And second, he's claiming this is essential. It's not just that it happened, that capitalism happened to arise through force, but that it was necessary that force, in particular state force, be involved in order to make this happen. Uh, which raises the question, all right, then why wasn't Marx uh, a free market anti-capitalist? You know, why didn't he come over to our side? Now, uh, Friedrich Engels, in his work Ante During, um, which is written as an attack on uh, During's view, which places I mean, which places force at the basis of the uh, the possibility of state exploitation uh, or capitalist exploitation, um, uh, Engels replying to this uh, seems to depart. So during so this comes, you know, this is after. Uh, Marx, but after um, Marx's capital, but before Bukharin and Prayer Brzezinski. So we're seeing a sort of evolution within Marxism here. Uh, Engels writes, every socialist worker, no matter of what nationality, knows quite well that force only protects exploitation, but does not cause it. That the relation between capital and wage labor is the basis of his exploitation, and that this was brought about by purely economic causes, and not at all by means of force. Even if we exclude all possibility of robbery, force, and fraud, even if we assume that all private property was originally based on the owner's own labor, and that throughout the whole subsequent process, there was only exchange of equal values for equal values, the progressive development of production and exchange nevertheless brings us of necessity to the present capitalist mode of production, to the monopolization of the means of production and the means of subsistence in the hands of the one numerically small class, to the degradation into propertyless proletarians of the other class constituting the immense majority. The whole process can be explained by purely economic causes. At no point whatever are robbery, force, the state, or political interference of any kind necessary. You know, so here uh, Engels is saying the same thing that uh, Bukharin and Brzezinski will say later. Uh, that in fact it came about through economic causes, not at all by means of force. And 
uh, in any case, it, it whether there had actually been force or not, the force would not have been necessary. That uh, it was inevitable when you start with a simple commodity economy that you end up with uh, capitalist concentration. Uh, is this Engels departing from Marx here? Well, it's departing from what Marx wrote in Capital, but uh, Marx himself may have, uh, you know, may have moved toward this view as well. Here's what Kevin Carson says in Studies in Mutualist Political Economy. Engels, to render the Marxian theory consistent and to deflect the strategic threat from the market socialists, was forced to retreat on the role of force in primitive accumulation. And if we take his word on the importance of Marx's input and approval during his writing of Ante During, Marx himself was guilty of similar backpedaling. Theories of the role of the state in exploitation were a strategic threat to Marxism. As a leading continental proponent of such a force theory, During presented a threat which could not be ignored. And ironically, even though Marx's own treatment of primitive accumulation was among the most eloquent and incisive ever written, Engels was forced to make a strategic retreat from the uh, treatment from this treatment in order to maintain a defensible position against the state-centered exploitation theories of During and other thinkers. Indeed, he was forced to deny that the history of primitive accumulation, written in letters of blood and fire, played any necessary role in the rise of capitalism at all. Engels resurrected the very same bourgeois nursery tale that Marx had put so much effort into killing off. And so. Now, when we come to the ABC of communism, uh, you know, this has now become the official uh, Soviet doctrine that uh, you know, not only were, were the letters of blood and fire uh, not necessary for the, uh, for the rise of capitalism, contrary to Marxists having claimed that they were, but that they didn't even happen. You know, uh, Bukharin and Pryor Brzezinski say, well, look, you know, the, um, the simple commodity economy will necessarily, through the fact of competition and some people being more thrifty and frugal than other people, will necessarily lead, lead to this concentration of wealth. And this is what happened. That's how simple, the simple commodity economy uh, developed. And so all of Marx's discussion of the, uh, you know, of the, um, the brutal laws by which uh, workers were forced off their land and uh, forced into factories and so forth, um, all of that just sort of fades away. Um, and this remains kind of, uh, and uh, Marxism remains sort of Janus faced on this issue uh, to this day. Um, whenever capitalists try to roll out the old bourgeois nursery fable and say, you know, look, the, the reason for, you know, the division between, uh, uh, between capital and labor and the concentration of wealth in, in, in the hands of an employing class, the reason for that is that, you know, some people are just thriftier uh, than others and they save and the others don't. And so the others end up being saved by the thrifty um, uh, you know, whenever they say that, the Marxists make fun of them and say, you know, that's not what happened. Look at actual history. And there was this violent, brutal exploitation and expropriation. Um, but uh, when instead of uh, replying to capitalists, they're replying to us folks, uh, then the Marxists uh, say, no, no, simple uh, commodity economy would never work. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it, regardless of, of how things actually went historically, even if you know, there'd been no, uh, no use of force, no state involvement, competition wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, have led to uh, the concentration of, of of monopoly capitalism, um, which of course is not what Marx originally said. Uh, so uh, you know, that was uh, what I found interesting in the uh, in the ABC of communist anarchism. It makes a very clear distinction between the simple commodity economy, which you could call a non-capitalist free market, um, 
uh, he distinguishes between that, which they seem to see nothing wrong with considered in itself, and capitalism, which they see as problematic. And so thus far, very much on the same page with us. But uh, then they you know, follow Engels and the late Marx rather than the early Marx in uh, treating the transition uh, from one to the other as essential and as necessary, contrary to Marx's saying uh, the opposite. And of course, we think that when Marx said the opposite, when Marx said that you need uh, you know, force and state intervention uh, to, uh, uh, to transform a simple commodity economy into, uh, into monopoly capitalism, uh, you know, we think that Marx was right about that because he didn't draw the moral we think he should have drawn, which is, uh, okay, well then you know, forget all this communist stuff and uh, let's be free market anti-capitalists. Um, uh, but you know, what I like about the ABC of communism, at least it does very clearly distinct and distinctly draw a, a, a difference, a dividing line between uh, an anti-capitalist version of free markets that is not problematic in itself, and a um, and capitalism, which uh, is. Uh, but uh, if you were to combine that with Marx's original account of how capitalism arose, as opposed to the the retreat uh, that we get later on, then I think you'd get you know, the the upshot would be free market anti capitalism and not any kind of Marxism. Uh, so uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, if you want to see you know more of this stuff, uh, gonna keep watching me drinking coffee. And then like, share, subscribe, you know, consider supporting me on PayPal or Patreon and see you next time.